In this video, we'll review the basics of measuring directional bearings using a Brunton compass. Bearings are azimuths that are measured in the compass direction that you would need to travel in to move from one fixed point to another location or object of interest. Geologists often measure bearings to help plan traverses through field areas or to communicate hike plans with other colleagues. Bearings can also be remarkably useful when you need to resolve your exact location using a technique called triangulation to help ensure your data are plotted as accurately as possible. Step 1. Assume the position, preparing to measure a bearing. First, get your compass ready by holding it in the palm of your non-dominant hand. Then, open the compass and fully extend the mirrored lid and the siding arm. Bearings are horizontal measurements, so keeping the glass flat will help ensure the compass is horizontal and the bull's eye level will work properly. To measure a bearing, you will need to bend the siding arm until it's vertical and adjust the lid so you can see the reflection of both your target and the siding arm in the mirrored lid. Properly siding in a bearing can be tricky at first because it involves carefully aligning your target, the slot in the siding arm, and the center line on the mirror. Positioning your compass directly below your chin and near your belt buckle is the easiest way to simplify this aligning process. The added distance between your eye and the compass will also make for a more accurate measurement. If you're in the correct position, the wrist of the hand holding your button should be resting against the front of your hip. You should be able to look straight down and see the center line, siding arm slot, and target much like you would through the front and rear sights on a rifle. Step 2. Measuring a bearing. Rick has decided to measure a bearing to a peak on the horizon. First, as with all measurements, Rick has already used his geographic references to estimate his bearing. He knows that the peak lies to the southwest somewhere between 180 and 270 degrees. Next, he holds the Brunton in his offhand and uses the glass to help keep it flat. He then makes sure that the siding arm is vertical, the mirrored lid is adjustable, and lowers the compass to a position below his chin and near his belt buckle. Then, Rick makes a series of course adjustments to the mirrored lid to make sure that he can see everything through the siding arm in his mirror. Finally, once Rick is in position, he uses fine adjustments to line up the target peak, siding arm slot, and center line, while using the bullseye level to ensure the compass is horizontal before reading the two possible azimuths indicated by both the black and white compass needle points. One of these measured azimuths should line up with Rick's original southwest estimate. If they do not, he will need to repeat this process until his measurements agree. Step 3. Triangulating your position. Rick has a topographic base map but is unsure of his precise location in the field area. He can use this same technique and the process of triangulation to help resolve his location. This is a really powerful technique when it comes to accurately plotting data like faults, contacts, and strikes and dips on your map. The first step in the process of triangulation is to locate yourself to the best of your ability. In this example, Rick knows that he's located somewhere along the ridge outlined with a red dashed line. From this rough location, Rick needs to identify at least three prominent geographic landmarks in his field of view that will be identifiable on his topographic base map. Characteristic peaks, bends in rivers, and breaks in ridgelines are all great examples of landmarks you can look for. Rick has selected a very high peak located to his northwest, Peak A. For his second landmark, he selected a low, isolated peak to his northeast, B. And his final target will be a prominent peak to the southwest, C. Once Rick has located peaks A, B, and C on his base map, he can begin measuring bearings to these landmarks using the technique that we just introduced. For A, he measured a bearing of 338 degrees, which agrees with his original northwest estimate. The bearing for B is 34 degrees, or 034 and the bearing to peak C is 220 degrees. Once Rick has recorded all three of these bearings in his notebooks, the next step is to plot the reciprocals of these bearings from the peaks themselves back to where Rick is standing. The reciprocal of the bearing to peak A is 338 degrees minus 180 degrees, or 158 degrees, and should be plotted as a faint pencil line starting at peak A and extending back through the area Rick suspects he's standing in. The reciprocal of the bearing to peak B is 214 degrees, and the reciprocal of the bearing to peak C is 40 degrees, and both of these are similarly plotted from their respective peaks back through the area Rick suspects he's standing in. If done carefully, these three lines should converge at a single point, which is where Rick was standing when he collected these original bearing measurements. Next, all Rick has to do is carefully erase his reciprocal lines and any marks that he made when identifying his peaks, leaving only his exact location. 
Yes, measuring bearings does require a little mental and physical gymnastics to do properly. But with a little practice, I'm sure that you will soon find it a very easy thing to do and that it will become a much used technique in your toolbox of skills.